This is your Kick-Ass Life Podcast, episode number R7 with guest Nicole Antoinette. This is the Your Kick-Ass Life Podcast with Andrea Owen, a no BS guide to self-help and badassery. Because ladies, let's face it, life's too short for it to not kick ass. And here's your host, the girl who serves it up straight with a side of crazy, Andrea Owen. Hey there, ass kickers. Welcome to another episode of the recovery series on the podcast. I'm so glad you're here. If you are brand new to this series, there are six additional episodes that you can find them all at yourkickasslife.com forward slash recovery. And if this is not your very first episode, welcome back. Thank you for coming back to listen to these really amazing stories of women that are in recovery that have decided on sobriety. And I'm really excited to bring you today's guest, Nicole Antoinette. She's a returning guest on the podcast. Her original episode that she was on is in the show notes. So you can go back and listen to that if you would like. And before we get into her story, I would like to just make a quick announcement. <laughs> that your kick-ass masterclass is still open for registration. We have about half of the spots have been taken. So if you want in on that, you better get on it. It's a nine week online class for women who want more self-awareness, more confidence, and more courage instead of playing small and coming from a place of fear, which is usually our default mode. It's for anyone who struggles with negative self-talk behaviors like numbing, people-pleasing, perfectionism, and really just not feeling like you are proud of the woman that you are when you show up in the world. So that's really what we focus on in this class is giving you tools, how to use them in the real world, because that's what I'm all about. It's not just throwing content at you and hoping that you can figure it out. It's really about learning how to use it in your real life situations. You get direct access to moi in our private Facebook group. There are live calls, lifetime access to the materials, and you get access to my exclusive alumni group for anyone who's been in any of my classes for free, where I go in there and I do monthly exclusivity that you won't be able to see anywhere else. And that class is at kickassmasterclass.com. This is my signature program. It's the most intensive program I teach in a group setting. So I'd love to have you and really start 2017 off kind of with a bang and really, really gaining that self-awareness that you obviously value a lot if you're here listening to the podcast. This class is really great for anyone who listens to the podcast and maybe you've read my book. It really is the next step. So kickassmasterclass.com for all of that. Any questions, please feel free to shoot us over an email. We'd be happy to answer those for you. So you ready? Let's get on with the show. Let me tell you a little bit about Nicole before we get on with it. Nicole Antoinette is the host of Real Talk Radio Podcast, where people come together to talk about the wonderful mess of being human. A recovering self-help addict and former goal-setting coach, Nicole's current projects explore how we can use grit and grace to close the gap between what we say we want and what we actually do. Join the conversation at NicoleAntoinette.com. And without further ado, here is Nicole. Hi, Nicole. Thanks so much for being here. Hi, any excuse to talk to you? Oh, I'm stop it. it. I mean, go on. <laughs> go on. Tell me how amazing I am. Don't stop. Yeah, no, I'm thrilled. Thank you for having me on. Well, this is officially your second time on. You were the regular edition of the podcast a long time ago. I will link up to that for sure in the show notes. And, you know, it's funny because I follow kind of what you're doing online. I follow you on Instagram and stuff, but I didn't know that you had gotten sober until kind of recently. And we have the same amount of time. And I was like, wait a minute, wait, 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 back up. And of course I knew I had to have you on this edition of the series because I'm excited to talk to you about this. And you had, you have your own podcast, which again, we'll link up to that in the show notes. And you had a special two hour edition (laughs) telling your story. And it was really fascinating. And I listened to most of it. I can't say that I listened all the way to the very end, but And I know you told your story kind of at length in that particular episode. So if anybody wants to go listen to that, they can, which I highly recommend that they do. But why don't you tell us your story? Like, what was your relationship with alcohol like 
you know, really kind of towards the end, like as it started to escalate? And when did you know it was time to really make a change? Like, did you have a rock bottom? What did your quote unquote bottom look like? I love talking about this because I don't have a simple answer, right? Like I think as rough as a rock bottom, however you want to define that situation might be, I think that at least what it gives you amongst all the pain is kind of like the clear cut, something needs to change type of situation. And I didn't have that. Not that, I mean, I'm not sitting here like wishing for a rock bottom, right? Like that's not necessarily the right attitude, but for me, you know, my drinking, I started drinking basically when I started college, right? So it wasn't kind of a childhood thing for me. It wasn't, you know, I was 13, 14, that kind of situation, which was my husband's story. He was really young when he started drinking, but you know, because it happened with college, it was very normalized. I think that especially for, I mean, not just for women, but the binge drinking culture of young Mm -hmm. adults in the United States is very prevalent, or at least that was my experience when I was in college. Like that's what people did was you just like get super drunk and party and do like, it was what everyone else was doing. So it was never something for years and years that I thought was a problem. And that's, I think it's an interesting when you think about any kind of behavior in your life, so much of how you feel about that behavior has to do with what the majority of the people that you surround yourself, like how they are in relationship to that behavior. Right. So Mm -hmm it wasn't something that I thought was a problem because it was something that everyone else was doing. And then I graduated college a year early. So I was done because I paid for school myself and was, you know, trying to get out with (laughs) as little debt as possible, still had a ton. But so I was basically out of school while everyone I knew was still in school. And I had just turned 21. And it was this kind of strange, didn't have to use a fake ID anymore, could go to the liquor store in my sweatpants and like buy wine in the middle of the day on a Tuesday because I wasn't in school and everyone Mm -hmm. else was. So I think that's when it kind of pivoted to me into being something that I just did more and more without really even thinking about it. You know, and that obviously that I, this I'm glossing over a lot. And like you said, I've told the story in more detail other places. But for me, you know, it just the most honest thing that I can tell you is that it was really just the center of my social life. And my social life was the center of my life. Like, that's really what I cared about was my friends and the people that I was dating and going out and having those relationships. And the fact that all of that centered around alcohol was it was all consuming, right? So when I eventually quit drinking, I was 26, I think, Mm -hmm. math, maybe, yeah, 26, it was May 1st, 2011. And, you know, the kind of months leading into it, nothing really super dramatic happened, right? Like I didn't wake up in the ditch in Vegas, like after three days, and I couldn't remember it, and I didn't have any teeth or, you know, any of those Mm -hmm. things. I think for me, something that's been a really big learning lesson throughout this whole process is that the stories that get dramatized with drinking and with anything else are those like really dramatic situations and not that they don't deserve to be shared as well. Everyone's story is valid, but those are the stories that are, I think, sexier, right? Like the the best memoirs or the best movies, right? Like this person, you know, like I said, like woke up, didn't remember the last three days or, you know, whatever, or, you know, had some kind of a drunk driving accident or something terrible happened, or they like lost all their money or their family or these kinds of things. And so it's really easy, I think, to fall into the trap of believing that if that hasn't happened to you, that everything's fine and that you don't have a problem, that it's this kind of very binary, like you either have this terrifying problem that everyone around you can see and you need to go to rehab or everything's fine. Mm -hmm. And for me, it took a really long time for me to understand that that's not the case, right? The fact that we have normalized drug use, which essentially is what alcohol is, like, that's weird, right? Like, why did that become the normal thing that like the norm is to engage in mind altering drug use behavior? And the only reason to stop doing that is if you can't do it at a relatively moderate level, like now thinking about that, like, that's the craziest thing to me that that's like how our culture is set up. And, you know, so for me, I just didn't like who I was or who I was becoming when I was drinking. I made a lot of really bad decisions, you know, and not bad again, not at the dramatic end, but just, you know, bad sexual decisions, bad relationship decisions, you know, not being faithful in relationships, taking like safety. Anyone, I'm going to stop you for a second. <laughs> yeah. It's so funny because, because I say the same thing. Like I made a lot of bad decisions when I was drinking, but then I'm like, does anyone ever make a good decision when they're drinking? Like, do you ever right. come out of like a drunken night and be like, that's the best decision I ever made? Like, <laughs> Never I ever. Mean, does that happen? Totally. But I will say though, once I really started thinking about this, I think that there is a difference in 
the decisions, right? Because I knew I had friends that were also drinking at this level that weren't cheating on their partners, right? Or I had friends who were drinking at this level, but wouldn't drive afterwards, right? So like there definitely was, once I started being really honest with myself, a degree of difference in what kind of those decisions were. And I'm lucky that nothing, you know, really bad and dramatic ever happened, but it was just, I don't know, like when I was looking back at the last couple years of my life, like around the time that I thought about taking a break from drinking, everything that I had done that I wasn't proud of, none of it ever happened sober. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that's, you know, that's not like the bet. Like, what am I getting out of this? Right? Like what am I getting out of this? I'm not sleeping well. I'm super hungover all the time. I didn't feel like I had really deep relationships because my relationships weren't based on this like thoughtful, honest communication. It was based on partying together. Right. So it wasn't one thing. It was just a lot of things. And I had, for me, because I was so wrapped up in the drinking culture, I mean, and that's back, I don't blog anymore, but I used to, and I was this very public party girl. Like it was a huge part of my identity and my image. And I think that it's really difficult to make a change when like you're outwardly associated very strongly with that behavior, right? Like being the one who always hosts the parties and the meetups and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I was really afraid that if I made this change that I would essentially like lose my whole life. Like the most honest thing that I can say is that I wanted to change my life without changing my life. Like I wanted to stop drinking, but I didn't want anything else to change. Yeah. And at the time I was naive enough to believe that that was possible and kind of the saving grace for me I had had really bad insomnia at that point for like five or six years. I mean, going stretches of time where I would maybe sleep like two hours a night, three hours a night, just awful. And I had an inkling that it was alcohol related, you know, and kind of went to some doctors, wound up going of all things to an acupuncturist. I was living in San Francisco at the time and was not as woo woo as I am now and didn't believe in kind of like any alternative things, but I wasn't sleeping and I was so miserable. And when I talked to her and answered all her questions about my lifestyle choices, she said, you know, I think it's alcohol. I think you should stop drinking for five weeks and, mm -hmm. you know, keep seeing me and we'll see what happens. And it was honestly like the best gift that someone could have ever given me because it was like an scapegoat essentially. Like my friends might not have understood that I wanted to quit drinking for essentially like personal growth, mental sanity, trying to be a better person reasons, but they knew that I had had such trouble sleeping. And yeah. so it was this very easy way to say, Hey guys, I'm not going to do this for five weeks because, you know, I'm going to see if this helps with my well, sleeping. Because your doctor prescribed it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, you know, so for me, and it's crazy, I think four or five days into it, into not drinking, I slept like seven hours. Wow. And that, I mean, I hadn't slept seven hours in, I mean, so many years. So the fact that then it also was working was like an even more of an outward reason for me to be like, see guys, you know, kind of, this is why I can't drink. And it, I don't know. I'm so, so, so grateful for that random acupuncturist in San Francisco. I knew that I wanted to quit drinking, but it was the excuse that I needed. And I look back and say, oh, I wish I maybe would have been stronger and wouldn't have needed an excuse, but you need the crutches that you need at the time, right? It was really helpful for me because I think one of the hardest things about making a behavior change, whether it's you want to start working out or you want to make changes to the way you eat or you want to cut back or quit drinking is like other people's reactions to it. And other people's reactions usually have nothing to do with you. When I stopped drinking, it was essentially like a mirror for some of the people in my life for them to kind of have to look at their own drinking habits. Because if we're all binge drinking together, it's easy to say that it's not a problem. But right. then as soon as someone changes you know, then everyone else is like, well, maybe I should change too. And sometimes the way that unfortunately people respond to that is by lashing out at you. And that was kind of what I said about, like, I wanted to change my life without changing my life. And six months into after I quit drinking, you know, I did the five weeks, basically what happens was I did the five weeks, felt amazing, decided to take a month to kind of test things to see like, what happens if I have a glass of wine? What happens if I do this? And every time I drank, I felt awful. It was so stressful for me to try to moderate because I didn't want one. I wanted to like be super drunk and do whatever. And so that was May 1st, 2011. I woke up and I was like, you're done. Like we're done with this. And after six months, I realized, you know, you can't change your life without changing your life. And I did. I lost a decent amount of friends and had to make some big changes. And it was hard, but it was definitely worth it. I want to go back to the five weeks she told you to quit, which is an interesting number. It must have been like the 35 day mark or something like that. But in your episode that I was listening to, you spoke to that as well. Like the you can't change your life without changing your life. And you were saying that I think you were saying in the beginning of your sobriety, you were still going out with your friends, you were still going to bars and doing all the same things, but just pulled drinking out of your life. And so were you saying like that didn't work? It worked at the beginning. I mean, it worked in that 
I was able to go to happy hour and drink club soda with cranberry juice and not drink alcohol. Right. Mm -hmm. So like, I think it depends on what your definition is of something working. (laughs) Like it worked. I was able to do it because I was just, honestly, I was so afraid that I was going to lose all my friends, that no one was going to like me anymore, that I was never going to be able to, you know, date or do any of those things. And I mean, I was in a relationship at the time with someone who I had met drunk at a club, right? So drinking was a huge part of our relationship. And I'm lucky that he was unbelievably supportive, you know, of me starting to make these changes. But basically, it worked until it didn't that, you know, I was still going to the happy hours, still going to parties, still going to bars, still doing all those things, because I was holding on so tightly, I was so afraid that I was going to lose what felt like the best parts of my life. Mm -hmm. And it was only after I quit drinking, that I realized that the things that I thought were great actually weren't that great. Mm -hmm. And it made it easier to kind of systematically let go of them. You know, I realized, okay, well, Hey, I'm sleeping now. I actually have energy. I'm not hung over every morning. Why don't I try to start working out? Which is something I had literally never done. I mean, I think I had gone to the gym in like two or three day bursts, right? Like randomly <laughs> when I'm like, Oh, I have to wear a bathing suit. Let me go to the gym. All the, like the terrible reasons to go to the gym. Basically. <laughs> Another part of this story, I quit drinking and started running on the same day, basically. And cause it was after those five weeks, I realized I had so much energy and I needed I needed something else. Once I started to see that the bars and like the old life really wasn't working, I knew that I needed something to replace it with because I think it's really difficult to remove something, especially something really big from your life and not replace it with something else because it just becomes this like gaping hole that Mm -hmm. is going to get filled somehow. It's going to get filled by depression or anxiety or going back to drinking or, you know, so for me, I am grateful that I had the kind of wherewithal to know myself well enough to know that I couldn't just start scaling back on going out with my friends, start making like some more lifestyle changes around the quitting drinking without having something else to do. And, um, a friend of mine had mentioned that she was going to do a half marathon, which I mean, seemed like the craziest thing in the world for me. I, the first day I started running, I, could barely run two minutes. I think I ran a minute and 45 seconds and thought I was going to die. Like, I'm so like, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. And I thought, you know what? A half marathon, like it sounds like I'm more likely to sprout wings and fly to the moon than to ever do that. But it's something hard that I can focus on. You know, so it's a great like, idea. And drinking. <laughs> then I met I mean, this didn't all happen overnight, obviously, but then I started to meet other friends and people who valued kind of a healthier lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And that was really helpful too, for me to kind of be able to see that drinking wasn't the only way to make friends, which sounds kind of silly. And I'm embarrassed to say that now, but I really thought I'm like, well, I can't be have friends if I don't drink. Like that was really my belief. Yeah, I hear that. Like, and you know, I had a belief that because I got sober when I was 37. So I was in a different season of my life. I was married with small children. And so for women, our age, it tends to be like the mommy crowd who, you know, brings, wine in a thermos to the park and like play dates revolve around wine and it or is drinking for me it wasn't you know I graduated from the bar scene but it was drinking every night in my kitchen by myself and so I think I had the belief that we were not going to find any friends that wanted to hang out with us because my husband's sober by choice he's not an alcoholic but he just doesn't drink so I was like there's nobody that's going to want to hang out with us because we don't drink and they think we're weird or that we're boring and that's actually not true I mean I went camping with some friends of ours last summer. And I knew that they drank sometimes, but I, you know, I knew that they weren't partiers. So I just assumed that they were going to like bring beer camping because in my life, like you don't go camping without drinking. Like (laughs) why, why even go? (laughs) It's just part of your, part of your stuff that you bring. And they didn't bring alcohol. And I think that I'm pretty sure they didn't bring it just because they didn't want to, not because like we're sober or anything like that. And I was like, huh, there are people whose lives don't revolve around. (laughs) Yeah, totally. I had a belief that kind of like everybody was like me. That's actually not true. There are people out there that you could be friends with who either don't drink or don't drink excessively. They do exist. Yeah. Navigating, I mean, navigating adult friendships is an interesting topic, like all its own. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that, and like drinking definitely like plays a piece in that. And I don't identify as an alcoholic. I mean, it doesn't bother me, but that's not a label that ever felt like it really fit. I never went through AA. Like I never did that. Right. That was another reason that I also felt like, well, where do I fit? Right. Like I don't have this other community of people in these meetings to go to and this other stuff. But, you know, so there can be a little bit of, I think, an isolating feeling since I've started to share this story more over the last, you know, five years. It's been actually really comforting how many people have said, hey, I'm the exact same. Right. Like it's so cute the way that we think that we're these like special snowflakes. Right. 
totally. like no one understands when like mm-hmm. you're not that special. So Everyone, there's like plenty of people <laughs> that understand. But, you know, I think that the social aspect of it, kind of the wake up call for me was that there were definitely relationships in my life that were really just kind of my party friends, right? Like based mm-hmm. around drinking and I'm not friends with those people anymore. And that's totally fine. It didn't, you know, it didn't have to be this like huge dramatic. You just grow apart the same way that sometimes that just happens over time. But it's been a good learning lesson in the years since that the fact that I don't drink, I don't think that that's the most interesting thing about me. It's really not central to any of my friendships. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, am I less likely to make really good friends with people who go to the bars every night? Sure. But I mean, none of my friends, even those that do drink, like that's not really their life either. Kind of like what you said. So, you know, I think at the beginning, my fears were valid because of the people that I knew and like the social circles that I was a part of, but kind of getting some distance from that. It's honestly one of the reasons that my husband and I moved to Oregon. It was kind of a fresh start for us. We were living in LA and pretty much all of the friends that I had there had known me before when I was drinking. And some of them I'm still really close friends with, right? Like making a change doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't people who don't come with you, but I did feel I don't know. I felt some pressure socially and I'm sure it was all like from my own brain, but there's something nice about the fact that everyone that we've met here in the couple of years that we've lived here have only known us this way, Mm -hmm. right? That there isn't really a comparison and it isn't as much of an issue because no one, all right, they just don't drink. It's not a big deal. It's been nice. That was kind of the reason that I did that five-year soberversary like interview episode, kind of everything in one place reflection, not because I'm, you know, obviously I'm still like totally willing to talk about it, but it was also kind of my way of like marking the story and moving on. I don't feel like it's the central part of who I am anymore, where I did for a couple of years. I felt like the fact that I was, you know, had gotten sober was like the defining characteristic of my life. And I don't feel like that anymore. Interesting. Okay. So I want to circle back to when the acupuncturist told you to get sober for five weeks. And you said that after a few days you slept a lot better. But how was that for you? Because I know the people who can identify with, you know, being an alcoholic, I'm using air quotes, and especially if people are familiar with what Alcoholics Anonymous, how they define an alcoholic, it's really the mind of it. Like that's the difference between somebody who can drink normally and someone who can't. It's like people who are termed alcoholic have the mind obsession. So did that happen for you or were you free from that? Honestly, no. It's funny. Like when I think back of how huge of a part of my life drinking was and how I couldn't imagine my life without it, it was actually in a lot of ways really simple to quit drinking. Like the things that were hard about the process was more the kind of emotional self growth, like work that getting sober allowed me to do essentially. Like I basically, are you trying to tell me that we have to go through emotional stuff? Like when we get sober? Uh, I know, I know. Right. Well, but (laughs) listen, alcohol is a really good mask for that kind of stuff, right? Sure. That's the main reason that I quit drinking. It was because I was sick of myself. I was a shitty person. Like I wasn't a very good friend. I wasn't very present. You know, I was really selfish. I was just making, and I'm like, there has to be more to life than this. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm not good at kind of moderation in general. And so like during that month when I was testing, like, well, I'll just have a glass of wine here. I'll do this. Like, I find that to be very stressful, like having to decide, well, is now a good time or should I wait till later? Well, should I have this or should I have this? Is two too many? Can I have three? Can I have it? Like, it's honestly decision-making fatigue is probably my least favorite state to be in or like that, like kind of indecision phase that it's much easier for me to be like, this is not a part of my life. Because once I really thought about it, I'm like, this is literally bringing me nothing there's no good things that are coming out of drinking. Like once I accepted that I could make new friends, you know? So it honestly didn't really feel like white knuckling it for me. It felt like relief, honestly. But I think that was because I was ready to make the change. Yeah, that's yeah, exactly. To be honest, every single person in my life was still drinking and still like there, there was no outside impetus to change. It wasn't like I read the, you know, top 10 New Year's resolutions that you need to whatever to like, it was completely inner driven. And I have learned, I mean, I made a lot of changes since then in my life, you know, lifestyle, dietary, athletic, everything. And what I have come to learn is true over and over and over again, is that I cannot successfully make a change in my life until the pain of not changing finally outweighs the fear and discomfort that's associated with having to go through making the change. And I can't force that. And I don't mean, I don't think anyone can, but you know, for me, I was so, so, so ready to do this. Like I think it had been subconsciously building for a long time and then consciously building for a while. And it's hard. Like, it's not like 
there's necessarily an outward indicator of like, okay, check, now you're ready. Right? Like there's, it's never that the circumstances are going to be perfect, but it was something that I really, really wanted to do. So making the change was easier because I really wanted it. That's really interesting that you said that. Okay. Because, and I want everyone to rewind and listen to that part again that you said about like, you have to get to that point in your life where the way I describe it is similar, but it's a little bit different. Like I call it the tipping point where you have to get to a point where the fear of continuing down the path of destruction, really what it is, but the path in the direction that you're going, that fear outweighs even just a little bit, the fear of going in a different direction, the fear of recovery, because a lot of people are afraid of sobriety. And like, what does that actually look like? And oh my God, I have to do this emotional stuff. And like, what am I going to do with my feelings if I'm not drinking? So One of my really good friends, she was on this series as well, Courtney, I called her up and was like, I think I have a problem with drinking. And that was in December of 2010. That was like right around the time where I had started drinking a bottle every night. Like it was my norm to just drink an entire bottle every night. And I told her and she was like super nonchalant about it. She was like, well, why don't you try quitting for 30 days? And I was like, ugh, fine. You know, but I think there was a part of me that was like, I can do this. You know, how bad can it be? And by day, I think by day six, I cracked and I was white knuckling it. But I wasn't ready. They call it research. You know, I was like doing a little bit of research, like sure. experimenting. Yeah. And it wasn't until May of that following year, like we moved, we moved from San Diego to Utah. That was a huge stress. You know, it's like, and then from in between that time, from December to when we moved in April, like I had graduated to boxes of wine because it was just more convenient. <laughs> and, you know, and I was just like getting drunk in my kitchen. And so it's like, I think I had to go down that path of like, drinking more. And there was definitely my soul was saying, you are coming to the end of this. Like Mm -hmm. this cannot continue. So I was kind of like going out with a bang. I think, you know, I was just like, it was like my last hurrah. And I remember it was in February of that same year. During that time, I got so drunk at a Super Bowl party. And I think I've told this story before my husband and I, cause of course, you know, it's like, I'm, we come home from the Super Bowl party, put the kids to bed. My kids were really little at the time. And I'm like crawling all over my husband, trying to get busy. And then we're like literally about to have sex. And I burst into tears and he was like, what is the matter? And I'm like, I think I need to get sober. It's totally crying. Oh my God. My poor husband. He was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it was just a few months after that. And then once I quit, I quit. And, you know, and I had one little hiccup there and a few months later, but I hear what you're saying. You know, once I quit in May, the white knuckling wasn't there anymore because I was done. I had definitely drawn the line in the sand. So I think it's important too, because I think for some people, when they first get sober, you might white knuckle it and it, or you might not, but I don't necessarily think it means what we're talking about. Like it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to go back out and start drinking again. And I think right. everybody's story is different. Like whatever you I need to do to get definitely, there. Definitely. I definitely think everyone's story is different. I also think that there's no one right way to make a change. Right. And like part of this process for me has been developing like what I now feel like is my strongest personal skill, which is being able to be honest with myself in real time about what it is that I need, right? At any given moment. And it's really easy to have kind of some retroactive clarity on this, like with having distance from it, right? Because it's been like five and a half years. Mm -hmm. But if I really think back and like put myself in that place of the person that I was on May 1st, 2011, when I decided, okay, like you're done with this. If even in saying that and believing that it was true, the thought of never drinking again, you know, forever indefinitely was so overwhelming that I like couldn't even begin to let that into my brain. And I mean, first of all, that's why like the initial five week thing was so helpful. Like I'm really big on experiments that have like end dates Mm -hmm. because I think the truth of the matter is that you're never going to know how you feel about something until you try it, right? You're not going to know what the hardest parts are. You're not necessarily going to know what type of support you need until you see what you know, the toughest challenges of anything are for you. So I think, you know, we have this culture that's very clean sweep, biggest loser, change your whole life overnight, you know, Mm -hmm. like grand gestures, which again are really sexy, but that's not the change process. Like it's one thing at a time and two steps forward and nine steps back. And how do I do this? And I'm crying on the floor and I feel alone. And, you know, so I think it's like being willing to give yourself whatever you need in order to change. Like if you want to change, if like, if you're just even, I've had lots of people talk to me about, well, you know, I'm kind of interested in coming back on drinking or your story resonates with me or like any advice. And like, I don't know, my advice is always, if you feel curiosity towards something, there's obviously something there. So like explore it. It doesn't have to be a, you tell everyone, you know, and post on Facebook that you're going to be sober. You're going to like, you don't have to do it publicly at all. You can, if that's what you need, but like, it could be, I'm going to experiment 
with one weekend or one week or one, you know, so I think experimentation is really powerful. And then the other thing for me, when I think back, not just on that time, but like in the time since that this idea of giving yourself what you need in order to change, I think for me was really what made all the difference that it's easy to say, well, I've decided that I'm not going to drink anymore. So I'm just not going to do it. But essentially you're relying in that case on willpower, Mm -hmm. which is like a very flighty, not, I mean, I think of willpower the same way that I think of like a gas tank in a car, like it does wear out. If you're just like constantly relying on willpower all day long, you know, you're going to get to the end of the day and have no more willpower left. right? Right. And like, or at least that's been my experience that like, I think there's, as much as it can be tedious and again, unsexy for me, it was really helpful to actually kind of like systematically set myself up for success, like to, to be honest with myself and think through, okay, when are the situations when I'm going to feel the most like a social outcast, not drinking? Okay. Mm. Why? My favorite question, like around any kind of change is like, what would have to be true for me to feel awesome about this? Okay. So if I'm going to go to a Super Bowl party or to someone's wedding or to whatever, like, let me think through that. What needs to be true in order for me to feel good about this? And that might be different for different people. But I think that we try to make changes too often relying on our good intentions. And we'll think that when we get there, the fact that we've decided that we're not going to drink anymore is going to be powerful enough. But Hmm. I don't know, willpower, for me, it's not strong enough to overcome anything that falls in the kind of like loneliness, shame, social outcast, like anything in that space, like we want to belong. We want to feel quote normal, whatever that means. Right. So I think like actually doing the kind of self work of asking yourself the questions, like what would need to be true? And and maybe the answer is that I don't go to those types of events anymore, (laughs) whatever they are, or, you know, it's, and like the layers of truth kind of peel back over time. That was, and continues to be profoundly helpful for me. Like just being honest with yourself about who you are. Like it's, it's funny and not really an analogy, but like a similar example. I just spent years telling myself that I should have a meditation practice. Like mm-hmm. you should do this. This is what happy people do. This is what you do for your anxiety. This, and like, I've had so many false starts, but again, because it was always things that other people or like some list on the internet said that I should do. And for whatever reason, I think at the time of this recording, it was like 12 days ago. I was like, you know what? I'm ready. I'm actually really curious about this. I want to give this a shot. So I had to sit down and say, okay, what are all the things that are standing in my way? Everything from, I know that if I walk out of my bedroom in the morning and I haven't done it, I'm not going to do it. Mm -hmm. I want to use an app, right? So I downloaded Headspace. Okay. But I don't like having my phone in my bedroom at night. Okay. So I need to put it on airplane mode and like put it in the bathroom. Like all these like teeny things that sound like kind of crazy. I'm like, these all need to be true in order for me just to have this meditation practice. So why am I fighting myself? Like, don't, (laughs) don't think that I'm going to go downstairs get my phone, have breakfast, talk to my husband and then go back upstairs. I'm not going to do it. So just like, give yourself what you need, you know? And I don't know there, I think there's something powerful about that. Well, and I think too, with willpower that I just wanted to tag onto that. I think that when your tank does run out, I think nine times out of 10 people end up feeling worse about themselves than they did in the beginning. And there's something's wrong with them and they'll never be like this person and they'll never figure it out and want, want, you can't rely on that alone, which brings me to what we've kind of been touching on, you know, the, the emotional side of it. And, and you mentioned in that particular episode, when you were telling your story, that drinking made you hide the person that you were, that you realized that you were never going to figure out and become the person that you wanted to be if you continued drinking. So would you say more about that? Yeah. I mean, I don't know that I was consciously hiding anything, but you know, when you're drinking excessive quantities on a really frequent basis, I don't think you have time to find out who you are because Mm -hmm. like, so all of your time is either spent drinking or planning drinking or, you know, thinking about how you feel when you're, yeah, shame, right. Or being hungover Mm -hmm. or, you know, like I honestly had no hobbies. I worked and made money. It's not like I didn't have fun. You know, I did other things, but like, not really. I felt like I was a very one dimensional person because I think it takes time and space and boredom to figure out like what it is that you're interested in. And I never really gave myself permission to do any of those things, like to be bored or to stay in for the night, right. Or Mm -hmm. to miss out on what everyone else was doing. Like I was very concerned about having the most fun. And it was very important to me to be known as a fun girl. And and that was a huge part of my identity. And I had to let that go. Right. Like, I mean, Mm -hmm. for me, I tend to be like a pendulum person. Like I go from one extreme to the other extreme in order to be able to like find some semblance of balance. I feel like I did go kind of completely the other direction in terms of how seriously I was taking running and this type of stuff. And like eventually finding something that felt more like a middle ground. 
But yeah, you have to give yourself time to learn, hey, what am I interested in? <laughs> right? Like, what would I do with my time if I wasn't hungover every day? Yeah. <laughs> and even that's where running came about. I was like, oh my God, I have so much time now that I'm not like either hungover or a raging insomniac or out drinking and making bad choices and then having to deal with those bad choices the next day. Like, it frees up a lot of time, mm-hmm. dude. <laughs> you know? <laughs> You're not cleaning up the mess. Well, okay. So now I'm going to ask you a really personal question. So what are some of the things or one thing that came up during your drinking that you had to deal with? Did anything happen like when you were sober that if it would have happened when you were drinking, you would have lost yourself in the bottle or any kind of like emotional stuff that came up that you had to deal with? Because when I was drinking, it was really easy for me to blame everybody. I didn't want to look at my own stuff and it was easy to do that. And I was covering up with booze. So my question is, did anything kind of bubble up to the surface when you got sober that you had to work on? Yeah. I mean, everything, all of it, (laughs) you know, the thing for me, like I didn't really have a lot of self-esteem when I was drinking because, you know, I think to have self-esteem, you have to make esteemable choices, right? Like you have to do things that you're proud of. And I wasn't really doing that. So for me, I felt like I was kind of this little tiny, like raw newborn person. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I had basically started drinking, you know, when I was what, 17, 18, and it had been like a constant central presence in my life for my entire adult life. When I got sober, I realized that I didn't know how to be an adult without alcohol, which meant that I didn't know how to be an adult. Like I didn't know how to process my feelings. Like I think a lot of the emotional intelligence type of stuff maybe this is true for other people, different families, whatever, but we're not really taught how to do that. I mean, at least I wasn't taught how to feel sad or lonely or anxious or uncertain or afraid and to not immediately like need to numb out. So for me, like probably the biggest thing I had to deal with was that like learning how to experience uncomfortable emotions without trying to find something to like shove them away, which was a lot of what alcohol was. It was like the answer to a lot of things like, oh, you're feeling X, Y, or Z uncomfortable things. Well, just like go out and party and have fun. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think for me, that was really the thing that I had to deal with the most was, okay, how do I be a person in the world, right? Which like Mm -hmm. sounds like very big, but it was really big. And, you know, for me, There were essentially three big milestone moments of sobriety for me. Like the one was kind of the initial time that we're talking about of like actually quitting drinking, right? Like stopping the behavior and then starting to take the like really wobbly baby steps of how do I deal with my feelings without numbing them out, right? And just Mm -hmm. kind of like systematically going through that process. And then like flash forward, kind of the next big milestone for me happened right after my four year sober anniversary. I mentioned that I had quit drinking and started running on the same day. And running was basically, you know, like replacing one addiction, obsession, you know, whatever you want to call it with another, which at the time I definitely, definitely needed. And I loved running and it brought me so, I feel like every life lesson that I know now, like somehow came from getting sober and starting to run. But I realized right around the time of my four year sober anniversary that I hadn't been enjoying running. And it was because I was running from a place of fear. I was really fearful that if I stopped running for any reason, if I got injured, if something happened, that I would start drinking again. It was like I had mm. made so much progress and I had learned so many coping skills. You know, like my toolbox was a lot more full than it had been that morning when I said enough is enough. I'm done with this. But I didn't trust my own sobriety. And that was a really big wake up call for me. And I realized that I wasn't okay with that. Like I didn't want to feel that way. So I wound up taking what turned into a year and a half break from running because I needed to prove to myself that if I stopped running, that I wouldn't start drinking. So that was really powerful. And it was really comforting and it was empowering for me to realize that I had done the work, right? And I had grown past that point. But I realized like how much of my public story And that's another interesting aspect of this is like doing this while being a person on the internet, right? Mm -hmm. My public story had been being such a party girl. And then my public story was like all wrapped up in, but she changed her life and she quit drinking and then she started running and now she's doing marathons and she's like sober and super healthy. And like, that's still just like another identity that kind of weighs on you. Mm -hmm. Cause then you think, well, what if one of those things changed? Does everything fall apart? Like, do I lose my livelihood? You know, cause I had an accountability coaching business and I had built a whole life around this. And that was when I realized that I needed my livelihood to be separate from my personal choices, which was a huge growth for me. Whether I made money on any given month, I'm going to pay my rent based on whether I'm sober or not sober. Like that didn't feel good. It felt like too much pressure on my sobriety. 
So I took a break from running and like wound up essentially wrapping up that business and taking a long social media sabbatical. And like, that was a year of like a lot of introspection for me. And then just kind of close this thought process out. The third milestone actually was really recent. Do you know Holly Whitaker from Hip Sobriety? Yeah, she's a friend of mine. She was on the series. Okay. Yeah. She was on my podcast a couple seasons ago and she's amazing. I felt like that she's episode, brilliant. it changed my life mm-hmm. because she was the first person that I have heard talk about essentially like all of what we're talking about in a totally reframed way that her perspective of why is alcoholics or like alcohol abuse or any of these things as like, you have a problem. Like the fact that you can't drink in moderation means that you have a problem. And it's kind of this like shameful, there's something wrong with me. And, oh, if only I could just drink like everyone else. And she was the first person to say, that's effed up. Why are we sitting here wishing that we could consume drugs in a moderate enough way so as to not completely wreck our lives? Because that's the ideal. Obviously, this isn't verbatim, but she was basically talking about like, why is the ideal not? I want to live this like awesome, fun, like clear headed, actualized life. And I'm just like choosing not to drink that. It's like an empowering choice as opposed to the sad reality that you're left with because like you're not strong enough to do what other people can do. Mm -hmm. And that like blew my mind. And that was really a huge turning point for me when I was like, this is just a choice that I'm making and I'm way happier without alcohol and it doesn't have to be dramatic. And when people ask why I don't drink, it doesn't have to be, well, because I can't, or because I have a problem or because it really kind of gave me a new set of tools and language to use around this. And I'm profoundly grateful for her work. Yeah. Yeah. She was on, I believe it'll be in the show notes for anybody that missed it. I think it was the third episode that we had. It might've been the fourth. I think it was actually, but yeah, she's done some really incredible work in the world of sobriety and recovery and a lot of scientific research too, which, and new age research too, not just like the old (laughs) stuff from the 1930s, which a lot of it is based on that. But We have been fed a lot of bullshit culturally about drinking and even using drugs that is the way of life. And it's like, I mean, just look at the commercials, you know, it's it's the way that you connect with people and things like that. And it's like, I have connected more with people as a sober person, even just in the five years that I've been sober than my entire life, you know, in my former life, when I wasn't drunk, I was still sort of unconscious and that's the way I look at it. I mean, even I started my own personal development journey around 2007, but I don't think I really truly started to wake up until I got sober until 2011, where I don't know if it was this way for you, but the only words I have for it, that it was kind of a rude awakening. It was sort of like, I think I wasn't expecting what happened. And for me, it was like somebody threw, (laughs) for for lack of a better analogy, someone threw a drink in my face (laughs) or, you know, bucket of cold water over me. Like there's still times, again, I don't know if this is your experience, but like, there's still times where I'm like, I don't want to deal with this shit. And it's not that I want to drink again. Sometimes I feel like it was so much easier being unconscious. And those are like the really uncomfortable times. Like when my dad died a couple months ago, where I was like, oh my God, I have to deal with this sober. Like I can't hide in a yeah. bottle of wine or, you know, going out and to a bar and finding the hottest guy there to have sex with, or those are the behaviors that I used to do just to avoid feeling the feelings and feelings are rough. And I, I think for me, it was a lot, like you were saying, like when you quit running, it was self-trust and like, you know, mine looked a little bit different. Like self-trust for me has just been an all around journey of just like, do I trust myself enough that I am going to be okay walking through this fire of feeling my feelings? Do I trust myself enough that I am going to walk through this fire and not drink or not do all of those other things? And Mm self-trust has been huge in not just my recovery, but just in my own life. Because I think that as humans, that is the biggest gift that you can give yourself is working on trusting yourself. Yeah. Well, I mean, and I think something like another layer of that that I would add is like, do I trust myself enough to know when I've reached the point of walking through this fire where like I do need to numb out, where I need to lay Mm -hmm. on the floor and like eat cookies and watch Grey's Anatomy for six hours. Like it's, I think that it's easy to set up this, like when you look at someone maybe like me or like you or like someone who has made a profound life change, right? And obviously Mm -hmm. we're talking about this in the context of drinking and to put that on a pedestal and, you know, well, she never runs from her feelings or she like has all these amazing and coping mechanisms and she like it's just that I'm choosing not to drink right it doesn't mean that I don't like completely lose my shit at other times and in other ways it doesn't make you this like saintly perfect person I'm not better than anyone else I'm better than my former self this is a better choice for me it's a better path and like being able to think of it as like 
I think I did for a lot of years feel shame around the fact that I couldn't drink like everyone else. When the truth was like, I actually could, it was just bothering me, obviously, more than it was bothering them. And, you know, really having to have that conversation with Holly and like, look at what is this thing that I'm holding up as the ideal that I feel shame that I can't reach? Like, it was just completely changing that. Like, I just don't want to do it. And so I'm just not going to do it anymore. And that's really, I think, another thing that comes into play when I talk to people who are interested in making a change, right. And are in those really stages, it's all like, well, what do I tell people and what will people think, which are all totally valid, right? Like we're social creatures, but also we don't owe anybody any explanation. Like you can just not do it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. You you know, it's, which obviously of course is simple, but not easy. Right. But there is something empowering about being like, I just don't want to, right. It doesn't have to be this dramatic story. You don't have like, you can just make a change. Right. And I don't know that it's, there will be other coping mechanisms, right? Like sometimes the answer is like, yeah, I just need to like, like I said, like lay on the floor and like eat cake and like watch trashy TV. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Right. I mean, it's not all the time. Eventually I'm going to want to get up and do something else, but you know, I agree with you on self-trust and just being able to be honest about like, what do I need in this moment? And, you know, kind of work from that place just like over and over and over. Yeah, I definitely, who, yeah, there's so much that we could say. And, and I, and I want to just kind of underscore what you were saying about how I used to make up stories about people that I used to follow on the internet or whomever who'd gotten either, maybe they'd gotten sober and they had even like my own friends that had a lot of recovery. And I'm like, you know, she doesn't drink. She must just totally deal with her feelings differently, like have a good cry. And then, you know, maybe like 10 minutes of that and then walk away like a totally changed person. And I, I know that's not true. <laughs> no. I think for me, and I'd love to hear your experience too. Now when shit hits the fan, when shit goes down, the difference is now is that I know it sounds really simple and weird, but like, I know that I'm in it. Like, instead of like totally freaking out and like losing all of my bearings, like I know that I'm in it and my self-talk is completely different. I'm like, okay, you know, this totally sucks. And sometimes, you know, I might get in the car and drive or yeah, I you know, I've had moments of like, you know, on the kitchen floor crying that happened not too long ago. And now what's different for me is that I don't isolate, which I think is a huge one, which is something I used to do a lot, which I think now if I do that, I very well could be headed for relapse if I don't reach out to anyone. And I know that it's really hard for a lot of people. I have a whole podcast episode on that. I'll I'll link to in the show notes about isolating, but that's different now. I don't isolate. I might do it for like a half a day. And I tell on myself and it goes back to what you were saying before about like, just being really honest with yourself. I got to thine own self be true tattooed on my foot because for me, it's about not lying to myself anymore. And if I'm telling myself that nobody wants to hear about my problems and no one cares about me and I need to just like shut up and deal with it myself, I'm lying to myself. A lot of it is about the way that I speak to myself. What's it like for you now? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I agree with, you know, the need to reach out to people and to have a support system. Like I look at the strength of my support system now and I have to remind myself that that was very hard earned. Like Mm -hmm. I didn't just, you know, wake up one day and have really strong, resilient relationships. Like that was one of the things that it basically took me five years to build, right? Mm -hmm. Like in that time span after quitting drinking, that if something is kind of all consuming the way it sounds like drinking was for both of us and you take that out of your life, you need to essentially rebuild, or at least I did, I need to rebuild everything, Mm -hmm. right? And obviously it happens slowly, but once you don't have alcohol as like the driving force in your relationships, for me, I was astonished at kind of what you said before, like the depth and power of relationships that were based on just like real vulnerability and like having honest conversations and stuff that I value before, but it's impossible to have an honest conversation with someone else if you aren't first having honest conversations with yourself. Exactly. And I wasn't doing that. So even the relationships that felt good to me and they felt like they were strong, they were surface level, not necessarily even because of the other person, but because of me, because I wasn't willing to be deep enough with myself to then turn around and like be my real self with other people. So, you know, now I know that I have relationships with people that I can tell if I'm having a hard time or talk about this kind of stuff with, with no like preamble, right. Which Mm -hmm. is really helpful. But I mean, I give myself credit for having built those relationships, right. That doesn't happen overnight. Again, no one's just going to like drop amazing friendships on your doorstep. (laughs) So that was really powerful for me. The thing kind of in the vein of what you're talking about now that feels really different is I used to be really under the spell the again the like cultural story that we're sold about the kind of glorification of happiness like I think we have a real 
obsession, especially kind of in like the personal growth, self-help space with being happy. All I want is to be happy. Here's how to be happier. When like at the end of the day, happiness is an emotion, just like anything else. It's a feeling. And when you start to glorify one emotion over all the others, it makes all the others bad. And it makes you want to rush through them as quickly as possible. And it makes you judge yourself for feeling them. Right. So then not only am I feeling anxious or lonely or, you know, insecure or whatever, then I'm also being mean to myself for feeling those things that are, you know, quote, less than happiness. And it really part of the process, this kind of growth process for me, took removing that. Of course, no one likes feeling lonely or afraid or, you know, Mm -hmm. any of these things. But I don't know, for me, I guess if we're going to call it like a tool or whatever, the tool is to not make any of these like states mean anything. Right. Just because I'm sad, it doesn't mean anything. It used to have the tendency to forward project, oh, I'm feeling this way. So that means this, and this person doesn't like me and I'm not going to get this job. And then I'm going to whatever. And then I would drink, right? Because it's like this whole, (laughs) okay, it doesn't have to mean anything. Like you're a human being. You're not a robot. Sometimes you're sad. Sometimes you're more tired. Sometimes you're anxious. Sometimes you get triggered and feel jealous over dumb shit. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's like being able to have like a little bit of, objectivity. And again, of course, I still get stuck in my own stuff, but okay, this is just how I'm feeling. And like, sure, feeling happy is great, but I had to take the pressure off. That's why I jokingly say that I'm a recovering self-help addict, which maybe isn't a joke, but you know, I kind of had to step away from that too. Cause that was another thing I tried to fill the hole of drinking with and self-growth was definitely something that I needed, but I also went too far in that direction. Like I'm going to do all the things right. I'm going to follow all the life hacks. I'm going to be so happy. I'm going to and like, meh, no, it's fine. <laughs> like yeah. you feel happy is great, but like, I would much rather have like a wide range of emotions and having the kind of skill to remind myself that any feeling is not the end of the world and doesn't have to mean anything really helps me not to kind of like spiral down into that dark place. Yes to all of that. I remember in the first couple of years, probably of my sobriety, they used to scare me a little bit because they were way more intense because I wasn't numbing them out with anything. And it was almost like, like I had to have the experience of feeling the feelings. And I, and I can say this now, that it's really beautiful. Like I never thought that I would say that like feeling grief is beautiful, but it really is just that rawest form of humanity that connects us all as human beings, because we might all have different details of our stories, but we all have the same feelings. And the more that you actually feel them, I think that the deeper your connections are with other people. That's what we've been talking about because like, I'm with you. Like I couldn't even be with my own feelings. So I sure as shit couldn't be with anybody else's. Like I say that all the time and now I can, and it's just made me just a better human being. Yeah, totally. I mean, but, and a lot of this, I feel like is again, easy for us. I mean, we have essentially our sobriety is like the same age, right? I can see if I go back to the person that I was on May 1st, 2011, listening to some of this conversation, I would like definitely roll my eyes and be like, okay, yeah, it's great. Like feeling grief is beautiful. Right. Or like all the things that I just said. So like, there is an element of like, this stuff does come with time. Like I have to remind myself that the way that I feel now was absolutely not how I felt. I didn't have all of this clarity and like coping mechanisms and all this language. Like I was afraid I was going to lose all my friends. I was like tired of waking up feeling hungover all the time. And I basically started running because I needed something else to focus on. Like I need Mm -hmm. running was the first thing that I started, realized I was terrible at and didn't quit. And like as much as getting sober, that changed my whole life. Like doing something hard. It was like a very physical, if you are an able-bodied person, which obviously is a privilege, physical challenges and like physical improvement is one of the simplest ways to build self-esteem and like strengthen yourself. And I unbelievably needed that. Like that for me was huge to have Mm -hmm. somewhere else to channel because all this stuff we're talking about, I have the words for it now, right? Like I have the language for it now, but I didn't, then I didn't at all. And so all I knew was that like, I needed something else to focus on. Like I needed a distraction. I needed something else that was going to be all consuming. And I mean, people can have judgments about that, right? Like, well, you shouldn't need to replace it with something else and just like sit in the pain and do the work. And like, but I couldn't do that. That was not an option for me. So Uh, yeah, I think that's a little bit, (laughs) I don't know. I like to give people some slack. It's like you're quitting a chemical substance that has had a hold on you for quite possibly a really long time. Like it's okay if you start running, you know, running amok or listening to recovery podcasts, you know, all day, every day. It's like, I think there are worse things, you know, I mean, do people. what you got to do. Right. Like, right. and that's the thing I tell myself this now with any kind of change, right? Like with, for example, meditation, it's obviously not as big of a change, but it still feels now because I'm at the beginning of it. It's taking a lot more emotional energy to make it happen than it will six months from now. Right. Like I look at how hard these things were at the beginning. It's almost 
like a funny kind of catch 22 situation that when you need something to be easy, like at the beginning is when it's actually the hardest because it takes like so much in order to kind of get that momentum ball rolling. But I look at how easy it is for me to not drink now. And that is not necessarily the case, right? Like things do get easier over time. So like part of what was really, I guess I'm saying this because part of what was really stressful for me at the beginning was just how overwhelming everything felt and how scary. And like I said, that thought of I'm never going to drink again forever. I couldn't even begin to conceptualize that. If I could go back and tell myself at that point, anything, like any lesson, it would be like, it feels like this now, but one day it won't. Mm-hmm. It's easy to like forward project how I'm feeling in any given moment means I'm going to feel this way forever. No, you're not right. Like things get easier. You do get stronger. And so, you know, so much of the questions and the fears that come from beginners at anything, especially with this, rightfully so they're valid, of course, but also just like trust that it will get easier, you know? There's that word again, right? Trust. Totally. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you so much. And everybody, you can find Nicole over at NicoleAntoinette.com. And like I was talking about in the very beginning of this episode, your Kick-Ass Masterclass is open for registration right now. And we do absolutely talk about numbing. So KickAssMasterclass.com. That's also in the show notes. Nicole, thank you so much for being here. It's just, I love these conversations. Of course. Thank you. And so we have three more episodes of the Recovery Series podcast. Thank you so much for being here, everyone. And until next week, I will see you out in cyberspace. Bye-bye.